Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Today I'd like to discuss why, despite so many years of effort, women in this country still aren't guaranteed access to reproductive health care. There's no one better to talk to than Ellen Chesler. She's a senior fellow at the Roosevelt Institute, and during her years in academia, government, and the world of philanthropy, she's made important contributions to public policy. She's also the author of a wonderful biography, Woman of Valor. When we talk about this, I keep thinking about Margaret Sanger, because it's what, 98 years since she well, opened the first? 2016 will be 100 years since she opened uh, the first, the first birth, birth control, control clinic in a curtained <laughs> storefront on uh, the corner of Pitkin Avenue um, in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn. Mm. And, you know, when she did it, it was just controversial like it is today. She was accused of wanting to... Um, you know, do away with the Jews uh, <laughs> by the, you know, Catholic Church, uh, to uh, do away with the poor later on during the uh, years of the Depression, Great Depression in this country, um, when these issues were so front and center to public policy. And she was working with Eleanor Roosevelt. She was accused of, again, um, racism and Everything. all of these things, um, when, of course, all she was doing was try to <laughs> give every woman her uh, human right to uh, experience the best health care and also to control her own body because as Sanger always said, you know, no woman can call herself free until she owns and controls her own body. And that is in the end, uh, you know, until she can determine how many children she, she will have and whether she will be a mother. And that in the end, that basic human rights issue um, is what continues to drive controversy today. I mean, let, let's remember, and I always try to put this front and center, that for years, um, for millennia really, those decisions were the province of churches and of male clerics. Um, those, they were moral um, mm -hmm. frames for family life. And when it was taken out of the realm of religion, uh, the myth and mystery of sexuality uh, and reproduction was uh, taken out of religion and replaced with objective science, um, there were big losers in the power struggles that ensued when uh, women doctors and women nurses um, and social workers began to make these decisions. They contested for a, a space that develops inevitably around uh, particularly you know, poor women um, who are often new to the city, new to the country, without the resources of extended families and so forth. And so whether it's here in New York or Africa or Asia, uh, religious leaders and uh, the leaders of social science and medical science contest to sort of occupy that space and help people uh, move forward in their lives. And inevitably, it, it, it just... it's going to take another probable <laughs> century or, or more to work out. I mean, 5,000 years of patriarchy aren't going to go away in one generation or maybe even two or three. And it's, um, it's now evolving, though, more into also a question of economic equality and, the fat and its impact. I mean, the size of your family, your own condition of how you can go out and earn a living and what you can do. So you had, we had great hope with the um, Affordable Care Act. Well, I think, uh, Honestly, Ronnie, the intensity of the reaction at the state level in recent years, particularly places like Texas, um, and you know, in the and the in the southern, deep southern states, um, uh, or even uh, we've seen recently, you know, uh, divisions in places like Colorado that have been tending to the left, but but they are really a reaction to the extraordinary um, step forward that the Affordable Care Act represents for American women in this respect specifically. And, and let me explain why. I mean, we have been protected in our use of contraception um, by uh, legal instruments, you know, in uh, Supreme, Supreme Court, Court decisions, decisions, whether it's uh, Griswold v. Connecticut uh, with respect to contraception or Roe v. Wade um, on abortion that protect us from government intrusion unnecessarily in our privacy in the matter. But they don't obligate the government to provide us any services. And that's a very, very it's different very uh, and important distinction. Um, Obama's Affordable Care Act is revolutionary because it places a positive uh, public obligation uh, on the government 
to, pr to pay for and provide women the means to uh, control their fertility. And that's important because it's not an issue just of privacy, it's really an issue of equal protection under the law. How can women who now comprise 50% of the labor force and drive the American economy, you know, more, it's not just women in, in the lower reaches of the economy, although that's where right. most of us are. Right. But, you know, today women businesses employ more Americans than all the Fortune 500 combined. So when you have women driving the economy, they must be able to uh, make decisions, responsible decisions about spacing, you know, con limiting their pregnancies. And, you know, inevitably what, what, what happens is that those who oppose this kind of progressive government um, involvement in people's lives um, are going to begin to go where people are most vulnerable, talk about abortion, talk about sex education, talk about adolescence. Um, those aren't really the issues. I mean, if, if you were against abortion, you would certainly be for contraception, right? But they are places that, in, given the politics of our country and the odd structure of our government, um, with now almost all conservatives forming the base of one party. They used to be spread mm -hmm. between the Democrats and mm -hmm. Republicans, but now they're all there. Um, and with that party occupying so many state legislatures and controlling the governments of so many states, even though there's no population in those states, so that it's so out of whack in terms of where the mm -hmm. American people really are. But given those structural situa circumstances, um, they're making progress. Yeah. And, it, and given what they've been able to do in terms of controlling the Supreme Court, they have the potential of having enduring um, we're talking uh, also, success. Yeah. It, when we talk about the accessibility, we're talking about family planning, basically. I mean, we're not, abortion, of course we want the right to decide what we want to do, but basically we're talking about providing accessible, affordable health care, yeah. which is very important. Absolutely, That's but and, and obligating also private insurers. I mean, for those of us uh, in the upper reaches who get our continue to get our mm -hmm. of the economy who continue to get our uh, health care from private insurance, obligating them um, to provide contraception, and that's where the Hobby Lobby decision of the Supreme Court becomes so, so burdensome. Um, although I, it's it's intended to be limited in its applicability, and I'm told in part that most employers. Um, invest in their women employees. They want to help them um, balance work and family. This is the unfinished agenda of the American women's movement, better balance of work and family. And they're not really taking away their contraception or exercising their religious That's, liberty. It's but just it, a few, frankly, nut cases. Is it the major reason why states or governors are rejecting Medicaid? It's not the only reason. I mean, they're rejecting Medicaid, again, because they philosophically don't believe that the government should provide health insurance and they see Obamacare as a, a kind of winding road toward a, a single payer system. They feel that ultimately it will be too expensive for private employers to provide health care and we will all go to the a single payer system. Frankly, I think that would be a great idea. I can't imagine why we remain the only, uh, you know, uh, advanced country uh, in the world that doesn't provide health care to our citizens. And just to wrap it up to <laughs> Margaret Sanger, I mean, my biography of her uh, was, was written long before um, this current debate, I mean, even before mm -hmm. the Clinton era debates yeah. about health care reform, although just coming up on those. Um, and what I came to understand about her is that she really did understand health care as a basic human right. Um, you know, and now that we live in a world with permeable borders where, you know, the Ebola crisis, other crises show us how interconnected we are, um, why would we want to be a country that didn't provide the best primary preventive health care, which is, of course, cheaper than treating disease or Another treating thing. pregnancy once it happens, um, to our citizens? We, we sort of tried in different states now with tobacco. I mean, that was an indication of how you can affect something that's going to come back to you at a great expense and, and illness, right? Yeah. It's all, but, you know, now let's, you're, you're at the Roosevelt Institute, which is to project the legacy of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, and especially Eleanor in this whole area. Well, I, I do want to, <laughs> again, link it first to contraception, only in that Eleanor Roosevelt gave Margaret Sanger the only award that Margaret Sanger in her lifetime ever received from a national uh -oh. uh, women's Organization of Distinction. Um, and when she awarded it, she was still the wife of 
Franklin Roosevelt, who was governor, um, she called her a woman of integrity, vision, and valor. And it was from that award that I took the title, the title. of my 1992 book, which, thanks to this controversy, has remained in print <laughs> ever since. Um, so there's well, one good, good outcome of it, yes. Um, but from the moment she entered the White House, she became a prisoner of the White House because her husband's handlers, um, I mean, who were dependent. Same old story. <laughs> that's right, same old story. They were dependent on Northern Catholics, Southern fundamentalist Protestants, who were the you know, mm -hmm. uh, odd couple that created the New Deal, um, and the same constituency that is now essentially holding the Republican Party hostage held Franklin Roosevelt hostage, and Eleanor could never, never get it. go public again in her support for birth control. Finally, um, <laughs> after Franklin was ensconced in the White House for a third term um, in 1941, she wanted to have a meeting um, as we prepared to go to war also, although it was before Pearl Harbor, and that's the story, um, she, uh, she oh, wanted to make right, sure right. that we supported birth, we, 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 we had some sort of public health care that included birth control. And also Sanger, and this has been so misinterpreted, was very concerned that not very little of the largesse of the New Deal reached um, African Americans, and particularly in the Deep South, because Roosevelt was a canny politician and he understood that if he was going to have public programs provided by the federal government, he couldn't give them only to Democrats. I mean, it would look mm -hmm. like pork barrels. So he made sure that even conservatives and Republicans at the states could hand out, you know, programs for, in the CCC or birth control or whatever it, it might have been. It wasn't birth control at the time. Um, she therefore called a meeting um, to finally begin to talk about uh, making certain that there was a robust public health program that didn't try to reach some African Americans in the South. Um, the meeting was called for December 8th, 1941, and she couldn't make it because it was the day after Pearl Harbor. But, but, but finally, they, the Roosevelt administration during World War II did They did begin. distribute condoms to the, the armed soldiers. forces. The soldiers. Never to the women. Nothing never to, to the, the women. women. <laughs> but now, taking Eleanor Roosevelt, she then managed as when she joined the, 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 United, the Nations. United Nations, she became chair of the Human Rights Committee. What do you call it? It was then called the Human Rights um, Council uh, uh, Commission. It's now called the Human Rights Council. And if you read the United Nations Charter, her part of it, and then look at all the different uh, things that they've passed worldwide things, you, you really realize how, how not progressive in the world we are. Well, America's losing its edge particularly with respect to women's rights. And, and let me explain. I mean, despite the obvious uh, extraordinary leadership that Hillary Clinton provides and continues to provide on these issues. But, but let me explain it to uh, most Americans who don't really understand the architecture either in terms of human rights or development at the UN. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, and this is interesting and relevant to your audience, I'm sure, too, you know, was asked to run for governor of New York by uh, people who wanted to defeat Dewey and make certain he didn't run against Truman. Um, she was asked to run for senator. There were people who talked about her running for president. She was a daily columnist, a huge right. presence in the lives of, of, of Americans yeah. um, of that era. But she quite self-consciously uh, wrote a big article in Look Magazine saying why she wouldn't do it because she didn't want to be constrained any longer by you know the limitations that politics puts on you in terms of what you can say. And she had a big idea, she said, for securing a post-war order um, in the moral and legal framework of international human rights and for building development institutions, you know, from the World Bank to the IMF to, you know, more social development organizations at the UN like UNICEF mm -hmm. and UNESCO and uh, so forth. Um, because she believed that no democracy would ever be secure without a base of social and economic well-being. And her husband, before he had died, had given his famous Four Freedoms speech, mm -hmm. freedom not only of... of want and... Yes, yeah, not of only religion and, mm -hmm. and expression, but also freedom from want and freedom from fear. He talked about a second Bill of Rights in the United States, mm -hmm. that if even if it didn't put these things in the Constitution, would, through powerful legislation and powerful judicial uh, mandates, uh, provide a floor of well-being uh, the right to a job and an education and health care for all um, citizens. Uh, she, Eleanor went to the UN, you know, thinking that this would be a gender-neutral architecture. She never really focused on women. Right. 
But when she got there, and this is what makes the story so extraordinary and so interesting to me, is that she found women from countries like India and uh, Latin America who had been parts of the liberation movements of their own country and who understood that uh, if it was only about men, when they got home it would be about men, as one famous Hansa Mehta from India said to her, that they ha if there was going to be a conversation about human rights globally, it had to explicitly talk about women's rights and discrimination based on gender. Um, I don't think they used mm. gender in those term, in, in those days as a term, but sex discrimination. And so they insisted that uh, within the human rights and development architecture of the UN, they would build a commission on the status of women, that when they wrote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it would not talk about the rights of man in the sort of French uh, droit de homme mm -hmm. tradition, but that it would talk about the rights of all human beings, uh, everyone, individuals, um, in that extraordinary visionary document um, is a foundation for um, human rights instruments that have since been developed in much greater detail by the UN, something called the Convention to Eliminate All Forms mm -hmm. of Discrimination Against Women. But the seeds of it are there. It talks about women's rights to be free in their choice of marriage, to have resources if they are widowed or uh, abandoned, uh, to raise their children, to work. Um, to have citizenship rights, things that we take for granted, although they only go back a century in the it's United where we, States. We come with women's rights are human rights, and right. human rights are women's exactly. rights. And that's it takes about 50 years before Hillary says that yeah. in 1995, and there is a huge global movement um, which educates uh, mm -hmm. that point of view, which uh, informs human rights instruments um, on gender in a very visionary way, looking at issues of sexual stereotyping, education, health care. Um, the UN has a, an affirmative positive obligation to, uh, for every state to provide voluntary contraception, never to coerce, never to force, um, with mm -hmm. this India and the problems right. or China that they've had, but voluntary contraception. And we, through Obamacare, have finally joined, you know, the, ranks. joined the ranks. Yeah. So now you spent how many years at the Soros Foundation traveling around the world and doing well, I've had a really charmed life, I, I mean, I, I must admit, in many ways. I, I was an academic by training. I have um, a degree a from Columbia in right? history, in his, but there weren't really tenured jobs available. Uh, if I wanted to stay in New York, uh, I had already started a family in the 1970s when you and I met in New York politics. So I got really lucky. Um, I had an evening job, and it became my day job. I was chief of staff to Carol Bellamy when she was the first woman ever elected. Uh, to, to a, a citywide, citywide office, office or statewide office city. in New York City in 1977 mm -hmm. during the Koch years. She was also, I should say, the, I'd love to say this, mm -hmm. the first woman in America who ever received a million votes oh, because good. the size of New the York city. is so extraordinary. <laughs> and there had never been a woman yeah. elected to a place. And I mean, it's hard to remember. Um, mm -hmm. We now have 20 women in the United States Senate and so forth. Um, but there, you know, there were hardly so, any in in any serious offices uh, in in that era carol had been the first woman elected to the new york state senate in 1972. um i uh, worked at city hall um i <laughs> have so many fond memories of you and others but also of the legacy we left for women mm -hmm. we put in place uh, daycare programs in the schools teenage pregnancy programs uh, nobody talked about that sort of thing um, in those. It, in was those big, I, it was the first time we really were able to bring a women's per perspective into the formulation of public policy. And you were right in the forefront. Thing. Right. Um, sh shelters, for violence against mm -hmm. women, shelters, uh, training the programs for police. I got lucky. Um, <laughs> I, I went back to Columbia for a few years, but then uh, was very fortunate to be um, at the found founding era mm -hmm. of the uh, Open Society Foundations um, started by George Soros and did a program in reproductive health and women's rights, um, which focused not only on the United States, but globally uh, and left in place some things of which I'm very proud. I chaired the board of the company that brought out the morning after pill. Um, I always, being Sanger's biographer, saw technology as an important element of the achievement of rights. Because she did too. She, she was, did too. She was. She, she was looking for that. She you know, invested that in the pill. and, and mm -hmm. found the investors to to support mm -hmm. the birth the daily birth control mm -hmm. pill. The morning after pill becomes after, an, yeah. an important 
uh, additional achievement because it allows you, if you, uh, pills are low dose, or if you forget to take one, if you don't use them, um, if you're <laughs> young uh, and it's not smart enough to remember that you have to protect yourself if a condom slips or falls, uh, you have a second chance. Um, we also invested strongly in the abortion pill, um, then called RU486, now known as Mifepristin. And to wrap this into some of the earlier things we said, I think also another reason for the intensity of the backlash against reproductive freedom is that it is now more uh, easily achieved. I mean, we have these new technologies that allow, particularly for abortion, much earlier when it's less morally uh, and, mm -hmm. and medically complicated, um, when you can get these pills over the internet. Um, this is deeply threatening to the 19%, and, it, and the dial has never really changed since Roe, of people who really are uh, offended by the idea of choice. Um, stigmatizing abortion over so many years and contraception and sex, sex education has made some people think twice about putting limits on it, but it still remains only a very small minority of people in this country who uh, are against of this progress. What um, do we get from these conferences? I mean, the Beijing, there have been a lot of them, Mexico, other places, but Beijing really brought such excitement, I think, to We're about to women. celebrate the 20th and anniversary, now, and so as you've been following, um, the Roosevelt Institute your new just <laughs> uh, launched a, a big Women and Girls Rising program. We had extraordinary representation from over 20 countries, 67 speakers. Um, uh, at the Ford Foundation um, just in September. Um, we had an investigation of women and girls issues across a variety of concerns um, from health and reproduction to uh, equality of economic opportunity, violence against women, uh, education, uh, work-family balance, really the unfinished agenda there, um, the need for governments to invest more in their in opportunities for women to better balance um, their uh, obligations at home and in the workplace through uh, paid leave, through flexible hours, through child care. Through our old issue of child care. Oh, exactly. Um, and it's extraordinary what's happening around the world. We are again becoming um, laggards um, in, a, in a world that's changing dramatically, uh, that sees the importance um, of women's rights in and of themselves as a moral um, issue, and but also instrumentally, because I think, and this is where Hillary Clinton has been just such an extraordinary leader, uh, even though she can't necessarily bring her own country along with her, um, it is in understanding, um, and there's now, you know, we don't have to assert this, there is documentation, um, empirical evidence from a hundred in some countries, that when you invest in women, um, women, in turn, invest in their families, their families thrive, their communities thrive, their nations, the region, and ultimately the whole, the whole world. Um, and so that it's not just the, the right thing the, the, to do, it's the smart thing, as Hillary always says, to do. If we seek to fulfill the unmet objectives of our larger development goals and also of our national security policy, because the stable nations are the ones where women are doing well, where women and girls are mm -hmm. rising. And nations in conflict, um, whether in Africa or in Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, are the ones where the women are not doing well. So isn't that interesting that you can really point to that? Uh, Hillary Absolutely. is now, through the Clinton Foundation, and this is really important, um, working with uh, the Gates Foundation and others with deeper pockets um, uh, on amassing that evidence to make certain that it is even stronger and uh, more irrefutable. So the 20-year anniversary, where is that going to be? Uh, it's going to be celebrated here in New York. I think there is so much backlash that the U.S. doesn't really want to have another conference, although it's sad because in a certain way there's a new generation rising, of girls rising, who uh, need the architecture that the UN provided to build a global women's movement. I mean, so much of what happened at the UN is the product of women from the ground, women like mm -hmm. Carol Bellamy, mm -hmm. um, who moved also um, from 
a local uh, position uh, in her here, but also the equivalent in you know countries so, in every continent um, to international forums and um, it the UN provided this framework of these conferences that have been so empowering to women's movements around the so world. So as women rise in political power, as they continually to build that sense of sisterhood and empower themselves, do you think then we're going to bring the United Nations back to be a really uh, appreciated and forceful Well, this is one of the objectives of the Roosevelt Institute, um, which of course venerates, its, its foundation is in venerating mm -hmm. the legacy of Franklin Allen Roosevelt, and there's no institution more important. I just wrote that a piece legacy. for a, a, a book that we're bringing out next year, uh, in addition to my own. We're, we're going to do a book from our conference, which I'm mm -hmm. thrilled about, and that will help inform. I didn't answer your question. The UN is, doesn't want to have another big meeting, but it is um, uh, in March of, next, of 2015, um, during the regular proceedings of the Commission on the Status of Women, going to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Beijing. Uh, those of us in civil society um, are putting out a book in July. We'll have some more events and a, a robust communication strategy around those events uh, in July. Uh, there will be other convenings um, elsewhere in the world uh, sponsored by the UN and by civil society um, right through to September, which is the actual 20th anniversary. So you're making it all very exciting, and I think people should follow it. Um, can they, on, on the internet, what do they do? Go to the Roosevelt Institute uh, and then... You can go to www.rooseveltinstitute.org mm -hmm. or www.womenandgirlsrising.com where we have the extraordinary, a whole video archive of the along conference. with yeah, the conference. Yeah, so fascinating. We had 2,500 tweets and many followers <laughs> and a very young women um, uh, you know, engaged in social media. Um, we've had thousands of visitors to the website since, so we're very, very excited so about it. So we could go on forever. I have the feeling that this is, program has been too short. Mm -hmm. But thank you, Ellen Chesler, because you've, it's a very exciting thing, and I hope that people who watch this will uh, go away with more interest in this whole Well, thank you, Ronnie. You were such thing. an inspiration to oh, me stop. when I was a young woman. You were, as you stop. ran for uh, <laughs> no, borough president <laughs> in New York and served as a council member and um, had a brilliant career. Thank you. Is there any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore? Please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.